medical staff. We have the medical staff, which is the school nurse. And she is a, the person who really looks out for the health of children. And she helps us to communicate with the uh, medical uh, team. And then our classroom staff, our school staff, the classroom teachers, the paraprofessionals, the principals, uh, they're all very important in implementing the plan as well. And our school administrators include the upper administrative staff that we talked about in the first ECHO series of this, uh, of this the first ECHO presentation of this series. Uh, so it's really a, a very big team approach probably as good if not better than they do in the medical settings. We include cafeteria workers. Uh, our food service program must be involved because they're responsible for preparing the diet modifications that we recommend. And then finally, the parents, we always include them in our teaming. Uh, so when we look at the family team members, we're not just talking about the parents and guardians, we're talking about the siblings and the extended family members, such as grandparents, aunts and uncles, because they're all involved in helping this child and this family to, uh, you know, or especially with our more involved children. And then the medical team members, we're looking at the, the medical, the physicians that are listed on the parent interview that are currently treating the child. So of course it'll be a pediatrician, but it very well may be an ENT, a pulmonologist, a neurologist, gastroenterologist. These are all really common physicians that follow our children. In addition, if we need swallow studies, we want to work with the hospital-based SLP and the radiologist. And there's times that we'll need a dietitian. Now, not really part of the medical team, but something to consider is that you also will want to work with any private feeding therapist uh, who may be treating the child that you are working with as well. Because by collaborating and working together, both groups can make more progress and really benefit the child. So when you look at our school-based team approach, uh, it really is very dependent on a core team members. And those are our therapeutic staff, those SLP, the OT and the PT, as well as the medical being the nurse. So every child should be followed by a core team of specialists. Um, and then we move down to the classroom people that we've already kind of talked about who they are, the medical team members and the parents. So we're teams within teams. And Vicki pointed out that we might also want to consider the caregivers on the family team. Right. Support. So thank you. Definitely. Thank you. And I will add that uh, anyone who is responsible for taking care of a child and often parents work and they have someone come into the home. Um, so yes, absolutely. Any network that the parents have that um, you know will help us to understand that child and how they eat at home and, and what, is, what their life is so that we can do better at school. So why is a team approach re recommended? Well, we felt it was very important to have shared decision-making because remember that first statement that swallowing and feeding disorders are complex and they're different. Every child is different from the next child. So the shared decision-making makes sure that we have a contribution of every discipline's knowledge and skills and perspective. And this just strengthens our decision-making. So each team member will share not only their uh, skills for diagnosis and treatment, but their philosophy. You know, what do they believe about how a child should be fed at school and what the school district needs to do? By defining the roles of each professional, it really helps to clarify for the whole team, uh, uh, school team, what needs to be done and who will be done, doing it. So I very strongly believe in defining the roles of each team member. So what is the role of the SLP? What is the role of the OT? What is PT responsible for? What is the classroom teacher responsible for? Everyone who comes in contact with that child should have some role in the swallowing and feeding of that child. And they should know their role and they should know the roles of the others. And you can always know you're guiding yourself in the right direction by asking, is it best for children? So whatever's going on in your school, in your uh, group, your profession, 
always go by what is best for the child. So what does it take to function successfully as a team? First of all, we must be aware of each person's role. There needs to be a very uh, a real lack of territorial concerns, which can be substituted with collaborative effort to establish and maintain, maintain safe mealtimes for students, because that is our focus. Uh, everyone must be willing to give and receive information from the other team members and be open to suggestions and problem solving. You know this because you do this all the time. Team members should rock, recognize their own professional limitations in relation to dysphagia and feeding disorders and should rely on the other professionals when they are not, uh, when it's not their area. And there needs to be a real open communication with team members. And communication can sometimes be one of the most difficult things because we all know how overworked school-based professionals are. And so being creative with your communication, uh, you may uh, talk to them while you're treating in the same room or passing in the hallway, but really trying hard to communicate with the other team members keep them informed, let everyone know what's happening with the children. So there is a shared responsibility. All members of the team are referral sources and that goes for the extended members, not just the core members. All, everyone is responsible for monitoring the students swallowing and feeding. And we're all responsible for the safety and well-being of the student at school. And this goes for not just with swallowing and feeding, but this goes with uh, anything. Anytime we're on a school campus as a school employee, we have to be aware of the health and safety of children while they're at school because the school's district has the total responsibility for that child's safety. So I wanna talk just a little bit about the essential roles. And typically I divide it into SLP, OT, PT, and nurse. In this case, I simply listed the things that are most important and I, I think you can sort through who will be the professionals involved in providing these particular services. Uh, so you need someone who can, is able to identify the signs of oral, pharyngeal, aminosophageal dysphagia. And this person uh, it needs to have had a specific graduate level coursework in dysphagia and when possible practicum and experience. Uh, they also will be the primary person to conduct the swallowing and eating evaluation of the student's current feeding status and provide trials of food modifications when they see risk factors uh, such as chewing difficulty, delayed swallowing, pocketing, or aspiration. So you need someone who will coordinate the assessment and treatment, attend the video fluoroscopic studies so that they can see for the district what's happening with the child and perhaps work with the hospital SLP to direct the study to make sure that if we need um, uh, to test check, check out fatigue, that they check, check out fatigue. If we need repeated swallows, they do that as well. So anything that the school district team has a concern by attending that study, we can help to make sure we get the information because I guarantee you send a child, you recommend a child for a modified beer and swallow study, you make all the arrangements with the physician and the parents and they go and they do the study, you're not gonna get that op uh, opportunity again. So you want to make sure that that study, that you get as much information as you can out of that study and by working closely with the medical team and attending that session is important. So you need to determine who would be the person who would be attending those swallow studies. Um, and then of course, writing the safe feeding plan, training teachers, treating any oral or pharyngeal dysphagia, um, consulting and referring and monitoring with esophageal dysphagia and um, monitoring the inflammation of the safe swallow plan. Uh, you also need someone who is there to on campus that can respond to issues and concerns regarding the student swallowing disorder. In addition, a school team will need to have someone who has knowledge of neuromuscular disorders, positioning, sensory awareness, adaptive equipment, and environmental modifications. 
So that person, those roles can be interchangeable, but uh, you want to determine who is gonna take on that responsibility because you don't want one person to have to look at everything. It's much more time efficient and really better if the different professionals look at different things. So uh, the next ones, the next, uh, the postural skills and mobility issues, need to be addressed, positioning and adaptive equipment related to positioning also would be for meal times needs to be addressed. Um, and this mostly would be the nurse. The next one, monitoring the health of the students, writing the health plan, individualized health plan and training the personnel, monitoring the students weight on a, a regular basis when you have those concerns, monitoring the lungs periodically during meals if you have a concern about aspiration and then assisting and contacting physicians, um, consulting with parents and teachers, helping to secure a better medical history. Uh, sometimes our nursing staff is very good at that and training classroom staff on undernutrition and dehydration. So one of your handouts today is one that you've probably seen before, but I, I'd like to make it just easy for you to connect it with this presentation is the roles and responsibilities where it really outlines all of these. Um, so the classroom teacher is so important because they're really responsible for the preparation of the student's food according to the plan and implementing, implementing the plan. So they really need to oversee the paraprofessionals. They need to understand the safe eating plan. They need to know exactly what's happening with those students in their classes. They also need to be trained to recognize changes in the students feeding or swallowing. So because often the classroom staff, the teacher or the paraprofessional will be the first ones to recognize that a child's skills are deteriorating. Um, so in that way, they then will be an information source for the core team members who really need to know that. Um, say, for instance, if the PT has positioned the child for eating, but it's no longer working, they're starting to slump over or their head is dropping, they wouldn't know that, that they need to talk to the, uh, that that wasn't supposed to be that way and that they need to talk to the PT about that. They will function as a teacher with IEP authority at your IEP, which means they'll set up the IEP meeting and run the meeting. And they will be responsible for keeping, keeping the health plan and the swallowing and feeding plan in a place of easy reference, as well as the emergency plan. Um, so they oversee everything. Uh, they must be able to follow the emergency plan in the event of choking. And the, the nurse will train the classroom staff on that but they need to be able to know what to do and, and jump into action when it happens and contact the swallowing and feeding leader whenever there is a concern. We also, uh, as OTs and speech pathologists, do oral motor and oral sensory motor therapy. So we may ask the classroom staff to implement some of those exercises and skills so that there's better carryover and better progress. Uh, when it comes to the parents, we uh, share our, the, they share their knowledge of the child's feeding habits, food preferences, mealtime environment. Think how important that information is. And we want them to participate in decision making. One of the things we learned early on in the 25 years we've been doing this is that we had to pull those parents in. We had to work with them so that they became a part of it rather than telling them what to do or what we were going to do. Um, so they also provide us, we, we rely on our parents for a medical history. Um, so hopefully they can do a thorough, give us a thorough medical and feeding history, any pediatric feeding disorder diagnosis and treatments their child may have had or private feeding therapy. Um, they can share their cultural views regarding food and eating, which we will need to pay attention to in our school cafeteria program. And hopefully they will give us permission to talk to physicians and therapists and that by signing a release of information. So right there, working closely with the parents really makes us stronger because if we have good rapport, a good relationship with them, we then are able to talk to the medical providers as well. And then to help us implement and like earlier when you talked about our, 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 our experts on here, 
uh, are the, uh, about them attending studies for their students. I posted in the chat uh, to see, are they attending the studies? And it seems like they, most of the studies happen in one part of the state around Portland. So it's hard, wow. for our, it's hard for our experts on here and it's hard for families sometimes to get to them and a uh, two month wait to do that. <gasps> wow, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, that's interesting. I'm glad you asked that because, you know, every state is different in, in my school district, which is a fairly large school district. I'm sure not as large as Portland. Um, we would just go to the local hospital. We would arrange it with our school district and go to the local hospital and work with those professionals because of course they're doing swallow studies with adults all day long. Um, but doing children is very different and disabled children is extremely different. So if, if you can work something out where you don't have, the parents don't have to go all the way to Portland, it seems like working with your local hospital might be a, a way to do it. Um, that would be go, that's where that administrative support is so important to go and say, look, this isn't working. We're waiting two months to get a, a plan. I mean, a study done when we have some real concerns about the safety of the child. So that's the suggestion that maybe we uh, make the echo model for our feeding teams in Portland to be able to zoom out and support people in other parts of the states. And, you know, there are travel uh, swallow study vans these days that, you know, that might be something Portland would be interested in doing, you know, coming to people rather than having them come to them. And uh, I know several school districts that use the uh, modified barren swallow study van that they come right to the school and conduct the study right there. So there are options and it helps to think creatively, but, but this just highlights the restrictions we have in a school system that you don't have in other settings. Uh, and, and we just do our best. As we know, if we don't get permission from parents to talk to physicians, we can't talk to them. We do our best, you know? So it's never as clean and as pretty as the ideal. You, you know, we're gonna give you, I'm gonna give you the best practices, the ideal, but it's rarely that clean. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about working with the family. You know, we already said they're an information source, they're a member of our team, and they are the connection between the school and medical teams. Um, I love this quote. I'm going to share a couple of quotes that I really like. Working with students who have dysphagia can certainly be difficult, but understanding the family's perspective can prove not only helpful, but in many instances crucial to developing and implementing effective programming. So if we don't try to understand where that parent is, we often can really have miscommunication. So I think this quote is the parent's perspective is extremely important. When you talk to a parent, whether you're telling them that you're um, concerned about their child's feeding at school or you want a video for a MBS study, at that same time, all these things are going on in that parent's head. They're, they've had medical concerns with this child. That child may have been in and out of the hospital many times since they were born. And so they, and they could be ongoing medical concerns. There's emotional issues that parents feel where there's, um, you know, just the trauma and adjustment of having to uh, learn about how to help a, a handicapped child, how to bring up a handicapped child. None of us are really prepared for that if it happens. And then, you know, sometimes um, the, the worries and the fears for what will happen to their child as they, as they get older, you know, their concerns for the future of their child. There's also financial concerns. There's medical bills, but in addition to that, Sometimes they can't have the high school student come and babysit me. Sometimes they need a special babysitter, which is much more expensive. And so, you know, often these parents come with all these concerns. You're talking to them and all this stuff could be going on. The, maybe the family dynamics that the grandparents are getting worn out helping them with, the, with their family when they need to go to the doctors, watching the other kids or whatever, because it certainly... Um, uh, has an effect on everyone. And, and earlier, uh, someone mentioned about caregivers, you know, um, being able to work with a caregiver and um, be able to call on them as well. 
So all these things are going on when we talk to parents. So, you know, it is so important. You want to build a relationship with them in, from the beginning. Try to understand that feeding their child is one of the most nurturing and emotional things that a parent does. If any of you have ever had a small child that was a little picky and you were concerned about the amount of food they were eating and the types of foods they were, it's very emotional. You can get very upset when you don't think your child is eating enough or is eating well. Uh, so uh, feeding their child can be very emotional. So it really um, is something we have to be very sensitive with when we talk to parents. Um, so we wanna ask their concerns regarding meal times and their home and their goals for their child. You know, use that information. A lot of the information you're gonna get on that um, parent interview is going to help you to write a better plan at school. Another quote that I like, school-based professionals should work toward developing an appreciation of the impact that having a child with a developmental disability can have on the family and develop sensitivity for the complexities that families with disabled children face. And I think uh, when it comes to uh, OTPTs, uh, uh, speech therapists, school nurses, special education teachers, we really do typically have a very strong sensitivity to what these families go through. So how do you- Point out, Emily, in our discussions about OGCOM and same, uh, same type of team members, uh, same folks we have on here, uh, really focusing on the difference in the cultural um, the home, the culture in the home, because uh, the whole view of disability can be um, altered by the beliefs and those, some of those deep-rooted uh, cultural backgrounds. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that especially when you talk about food and meal times, there are some very strong cultural uh, attitudes about food and feeding. So that's a really good point. So how do you work? How do you successfully work with the uh, family team? Inform the parents as soon as you know there's a concern respect their role and their knowledge of their child and seek out information that um, they can give you to help you and help the school team, uh, which is step two of the procedure. Keep them informed of their child's pride. This is the one thing parents always say, if they could just communicate with me, maybe send a note back and forth, maybe keep me informed. So communicating with the, child, with the parents about the child's progress and the decisions that are being made regarding their child's meal times, it really does help. And then when they're concerned, really listen to their concerns and invite them to come in and demonstrate how they feed their child at home. The way their child needs to eat at school may be different from home due to the different environment, which is much noisier, different seating arrangement. But having the parents show us what they do, it may help to say, well, okay, that's, great, we actually can do that. So I think really working very closely with those parents that way is important. So in addition, be, you wanna be very sensitive to the cultural values in regards to food and meal times and to their cultural habits at home. Uh, connect them when possible to other families and organizations and follow the procedure, which includes working with the parents. So Arvidsson and Leichtengriff say, work towards a child having a meaningful and functional mealtime experience, both at home and school, while maintaining safety and efficiency. And this just really summarizes what we want to do, because we want children to be happy when they're eating. We want them to get be functional, have them get enough nutrition, um, and we want it to be uh, pleasurable. So working now, we'll move to the medical team. So the medical team is typically made up of definitely the pediatrician, other physicians, as we talked about, the hospital SLP and radiologist, and a dietitian. So we have some challenges when it comes to working with medical teams uh, in the schools. First of all, we're working with minors, and these children are dependent on their families, and therefore, FERPA comes in and we are not able to communicate with outside providers without parent permission. So some most of the times that is not a concern, but there have been times in our practice where 
we have not been able to talk to a physician when we really, really needed to. So much so that we even had to go to the attorneys to see what our options were. So that will happen in t you know, at times, um, but most of the times we're able to get those releases, but there may be times that you can't and that you have to go a different route. Um, we also are limited by the medical information we have access to. It's provided by parents and their memory and their experience. So if we can get that permission to talk to the physicians, it's always nice to really have a little bit more thorough uh, uh, medical uh, history. And then our obligation to safety. And it's unlike any other setting. When a child steps foot on a school campus, we take the place of the parents. It's called in local parentis. And it means that the school district is completely responsible for that child's health and safety. So that's very different than a church or a community center or a hospital or anywhere. Our responsibility is to that child. So if we have to feed the child differently than they're eating at home and the parents don't agree, we really still have to feed them the way our team feels is safe. So that can sometimes be a challenge. And then I, I think um, sometimes our services aren't sought after, like with a private feeding therapist or even a physician or requested. It's us recognizing the concern and the need and contacting the family. So it'll be the other way as well. But a lot of times it's going to be that we uh, are, get, are talking with the parents. So it's real important when you can to collaborate with the physicians, especially when there's a change in the diet, child's diet, which really may indicate a medical concern. So if you're finding you're putting that child on a more restrictive diet, there may be something medically going on that needs to be followed up on. If the student receives all or part of their nutrition and hydration via an enteral tube feeding and if, or if there's a change, they're tube fed and now they wanna to go to oral or they're oral fed and they need to go to tube, you really need to work with the physicians on that. Um, when there are medically complex conditions that may result in a sick child attending school, and you'll see in our, uh, our case history today that I'm gonna present, that was the case in, the, in this one. And uh, or concerns about the health status of the student. If the team is very concerned, then they may want to talk, contact the doctor. And then um, when the medical status is kind of interfering with the appropriate assessment and treatment strategies that we're able to do, we feel like we need more medical information to really design a good plan. Uh, of course, when we need a script for an instrumental evaluation, or if you have a concern about the child's nutritional intake, undernutrition or dehydration, and to get a medical history. So working with the, the school team is responsible for establishing a safe feeding plan based on the information gathered from the parents and guardian and our assessment. When the team obtains a script from a physician, they must consider that script, but they are not bound by it the district maintains the obligation to secure safe feeding of the child at school. And this is a statement by Asha. I'm not gonna read it, but it's, it is on site. And um, it basically says what I just said, that a medical prescription uh, is not required for SLPs. Now I am not familiar with the OT codes and what they say in regards to swallowing uh, medical prescriptions. I think, I, I know uh, in my uh, school district, in my state, uh, OTs and PTs both need uh, physician orders to treat children. So that is a little different from speech. So I don't know how this will affect it. That's something you're gonna have to look in to with your own state regulations. Um, but why wouldn't a district need a physician's referral? Um, or script, okay? Well, because of what I said earlier about in loco parentis, the, the responsibility for safety lies with the school. So if the physician were to write a script that we could not follow, and they often did or do, um, then if we were relying on that script, we would be in a very difficult situation where we couldn't follow it. So uh, what 
our attorneys told us is that it was not necessary. We were a separate entity. We could make these decisions. Um, but I know in Oregon that I think that the way they say it is that you um, seek a script if it's not received or if it's considered to be not safe for the student, you would then document on the IEP for consideration. So you have one of two ways you can do it. You can say, well, we're, we're really not going to go through that step of requesting a script because parents may not even let us do that. Um, so then we're gonna proceed and with safe eating, or we're gonna ask, we're gonna try, and if we don't, will still go forward with safe eating. Either way that would work. And I think some, a lot of districts that I've worked with feel a little more secure in at least asking for a physician script than not asking. And you know that um, all of the school records can be shared within the school district. So whether it's the nurse's records or our uh, therapeutic notes or anything, they can be shared from school to school, from program to program within the school district. However, they cannot be shared outside of the school district without parent permission. So in all these teams that we just talked about, school-based, family, medical, the parents are the constant. And when we get them into the school, they've been feeding their child they've been the one responsible for uh, establishing safe eating. Then we come in and we do it in the school setting and we work with the family and the medical team. But by the time they hit 21, it really bounces back to the family. And so we want to try to prepare our children for that stage where they are a little more independent, a little more functional, and where the family team really understands what they need to do because eventually, we will no longer be in the picture. So school team models, or how can you make the team approach work in your district? Um, uh, everywhere we looked, they used a team approach, but you know, the teams can be different. And so what I like to do is I want to give you some ideas of how teams can function, and then you can really um, choose the model or come up with another model that would work best given your situation. So it's gonna be based very much on the available trained and experienced staff that you have, uh, the location of those staff members, are they on campus? Or are they at a separate site that they come into? Um, it's going to depend on the number of students we're talking about um, and the other team members and where they're housed. It's really gonna depend on whether you're in a rural setting or an urban setting. Uh, how you manage it. So let's talk about some of the ways other districts have done it. The first is a school-based team, and that's where the people who provide the therapy, the speech therapy, the occupational therapy, the physical therapy, the people who provide those therapies for students on campus are the swallowing and feeding team, okay? And of course the nurse. Um, so each school in the district is then assigned a swallowing and feeding team, and a team leader to oversee the process, okay? And that's usually the person on campus with the most knowledge and skills on dysphagia because out of swallowing and feeding, the swallowing piece is probably the most concerning because of the safety factors. Um, so the school-based team evaluates the student swallowing and feeding and establishes a safe feeding protocol and monitors and does therapy and does all of that. Uh, okay, a question, oh, you're doing a poll, okay. So what are the benefits of the school-based team? First of all, it facilitates, um, okay, I'm having trouble seeing here. It facilitates regular monitoring um, because the people are on campus. And it also involves for more involved therapy because the uh, therapeutic staff is on campus as well. Um, the team members are available. They're not in a different location. So they're able to answer questions easier and they're there for emergencies when they occur. And uh, the team members know their uh, school uh, teachers and parents and all that. The challenge is, is that it really requir requires a large number of specially trained SLPs and or OTs. And it makes it very difficult to update skills and do professional development because you have so many people, one for each school, 
that would need to be trained. Um, and, and then having such, you know, you'd only work with the children at your schools and that would result in a small caseload, um, which means you won't get a large number of students uh, with swallowing. And so it takes a while to really build your experience. Now, a, separate, a system core team is a separate team. And um, this team is comprised of the core team members that we talked about. They specialize in swallowing and feeding and they travel to the different school sites to set up a, a plan. Now, they may not uh, go there together. They may go separately, but they all are doing their part to establish a plan and then we'll get together. And then they have to um, get together to, to determine how the monitoring from maintenance will go. Um, they also must work collaboratively with the SLPs, OTs, PTs, and nurses on the campus so that um, you have some eyes and ears when you're not on that campus. Um, they are responsible for training the staff. Um, Deborah, I'm seeing this poll and it's kind of right in the middle of my PowerPoint. Is it possible for me to get rid of that window? I'm sorry, Emily, I didn't realize it hung around. I wanted to get a quick feel for that as we answer our uh, questions about team and relationship. Okay. Uh, it's, it should be gone now, I apologize. Uh, there was a third of our group today that work with their, uh, early childhood uh, or that three to five group and two thirds of today say no. Yes. At our recent conference, 130 out of 152 Work with that. Work with that age. Oh, higher group. number. Getting the feel for that. Who's here today? Sorry. Okay, so it's still blocking my screen. I don't know if I need to do something. Um, if, if you yeah. answer it, it goes away. There you go. I got it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, so the the core team will train uh, the school staff so that they know what, how to safely feed the child and will be responsible for monitoring. Now in in some districts, from what I gather in Oregon, the most knowledgeable professional may not be housed on the school campus. And so the core team could consist of that professional, the SLP or the OT, and then the other professionals would be school-based. So that would work too. So the benefits and challenges of a core team is that it does work well for small districts or for districts with very few dysphagia trained professionals. Um, it would work well with um, in a rural setting probably. Uh, core team members will have a larger swallowing and feeding caseload, they will be more specialized and so they'll develop more experience and knowledge. And then updating their skills will be much easier to achieve because there's fewer people. Now, the challenge is, is that you may have some uh, therapeutic professionals who are on campus and could address the swallowing and feeding. So it's an underutilization of trained professionals on campus. So you're bringing someone in when really there's someone there that could do it. And that because these trained, the core team is not, um, based on the campus, then communication and access to the team is difficult and ongoing monitoring and maintenance might be a little more difficult as well. Uh, so in some schools where district have therapists trained and, and some that don't, they'll do a combination of those two approaches. So when possible, they do the school, but when not, they will do the core team. Uh, so the benefits of the combination is that professionals with the knowledge and skills are able to use them to address swelling in their schools. You're not having to bring someone in. And it really moves a district more towards the goal of a school-based team, which in my opinion is the ideal uh, setup. The challenges is that it will take additional administrative attention to coordinate the schools that use a core team and the schools that are school-based. And then there's a consultant, and this is very successful in some school districts where there is a specialist, a swallowing and feeding specialist that um, then trains the school team, sets up the child's swallowing and feeding plan and the diet modifications and everything. And then visits the sites on a regular basis. And this, the ones that I've seen that are most successful is when this is their only job. The only job is, and this was in, this is in a large district, in a small district it wouldn't be, 
Um, but their only job is to set up smaller plans, to train staff, and to monitor. The benefits is that it provides services to smaller districts who may not have many trained SLPs or OTs. And the challenge is that the, the consultant is not on campus and may not be available when needed if they're doing the whole district. And what we did later, uh, maybe five years before I retired from my school district, is we started a consultant model where all of our schools were school-based. So the SLP, OT, PT, and nurse were all on campus treating children for other things, um, as well as swallowing and feeding. But we had a consultant, a therapist who was very passionate about swallowing and feeding and very knowledgeable. And so we, she, she got two days a week to go and help other school therapists uh, do the uh, swallow evaluation or write the plan. And that, the feedback from that particular model was extremely important. So you would have your school-based model, but then you would have a, someone to fall back on for uh, advice and information and guidance, okay? So this par pyramid shows you the different models and the personnel requirements. So the one at the bottom, the school base, really requires the most trained professionals on up to the district consultant, which really only requires one person. So you can choose more than one model depending on your school district. Uh, so you may have a, a special needs uh, school where the SLP, OT, PT, and nurse all stay at that school and treat all those children. Well, that would be their team, but the rest of the school district may need a traveling team, a core team. So um, it really just depends on uh, where you have your specialty teams already in place. Don't hesitate to use those. So if you have a preschool team in place, then they can handle the swallowing and feeding at the preschool level. So I wanna talk a little bit about providing swallowing and feeding in a preschool setting. And um, so in, I, the way I think I wanna do it is to just let you know what we did. In my district, we, we went into the daycare programs um, to provide uh, therapeutic services, speech and OT, PT. And so we knew that since these children had evaluations, they had identified swallowing and feeding problems, that um, this team of people really needed to establish a swallow plan, even though the school district wasn't responsible for feeding the child. Um, so we decided that what we needed to do was do the plan, um, involve the director of the daycare program, and the classroom teachers and paras and uh, have them at the IEP. And then the responsibility for implementing the plan shifted to not only the daycare center, but to the parents as well. So we gave them the information of how to safely feed the child. And because they were on those campuses and not on a public school campus, the responsibility for implementing that went to the parents and the school. And when the SLP and OT were on campus, they would uh, monitor the, the feeding when possible to see how things were going. And they were also available on a consultant basis to talk to the director of the school program. Um, so typically the school nurses do not go to the preschools in my district. So they would just go one time to do a training um, <clears throat> on just the health and safety. Um, if there was positioning concerns, the PT would set them up as well. Um, so we would train the classroom, the daycare staff on how to safely feed the child. And then it was up to the director to make sure that trained people were always feeding that student. If liquid or food modification was needed, because you know more and more involved children are going to your typical daycare programs, then that really was up to the parents to um, provide that food and that food modification. Um, so in summary, the, the private preschool or daycare is ultimately responsible. Uh, the director of the program gets involved. 
the OT and, and speech will monitor the implementation. If they observe that the child is not being fed according to the plan, they notify the director and the parents. A Head Start in my school district was part of our schools. They were on our campuses they, or they had standalone buildings. And we provided all services to Head Start, uh, special education services, speech, OT, PT, everything. Um, so in that case, we pretty much treated it like one of our schools. So I don't know how you're feeling about the early intervention program. I understand that you have a outside agency that comes in and I don't know how you feel about the uh, team models. Does anyone have any discussion? I do have a couple more sections. We're probably running late here, but um, what would you like to talk about some of these things we've talked about today? I, I guess I think one of the problems that I see with our the, the transitioning from early childhood to um, school base is a lot of times they'll just have in their IFSPs, oh, we're working on feeding or they were giving them cues to slow down. There's not actually a safe feeding protocol established or there hasn't ever been a feeding team working with these kids. So we'll get a lot of these surprises in the fall when they're, they're having difficulties with eating and then overload it. So we're trying to train a lot of our SLPs that when those transition meetings happening, they're looking for those cues so that we can meet with the families over the summer to get them established before school starts. That's a wonderful idea. We had almost the opposite problem where we had children getting EI services that had very involved feeding and swallowing plans and programs. And then um, the, when they would transition to us, the parents expected the same level of intervention that they were getting at, at the EI, which of course in a school setting we couldn't do. And what we found worked best, and I think it would work best in your situation as well, we really got to know our EI providers and talk to them and um, ahead of time. And so, you know, we asked them, let us know if you have any children coming in that have feeding and swallowing issues so that we can collaborate. And because we found once there's a negative um, approach from the parents moving from EI to school, it's very hard to undo that. So we wanted to be proactive and really get the EI therapist on our team working with us. So I think that finding out who those people are and seeing what they're doing would be helpful. But as far as them not doing the swallowing and feeding, um, then you just start from the beginning with referrals and you know use the, doing the procedure from the very beginning as you would with any child. Yeah, and I don't think it was, you know, a lot of times like someone had mentioned that they're written under like adaptive goals. And so like they're working on them, they're working on all of these skills and they're addressing the needs at the preschool level. And it makes sense with how they're focusing on it. It's just that, like you said, there's a shift from what we can, what they do in preschool to what we do in schools. And I think just being, have, bridging that gap, building that communication between different teams is so crucial. Yeah. Amber, it really worked well. It was really wonderful. Um, and um, I did a presentation at ASHA this year on communication between um, ICU, EI, and the schools. And so it's really a thing that we need to work on and get better at working, all of us working together, you know, because we're all involved with these children. Um, so that, that was a great comment. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wants to share? Devin, would you like to expand on your comment? Or... I just posted a comment that saying that the um, in EI, sometimes because the program is shorter, um, there's not really a mealtime involved. And so the only thing they have is a snack and uh, it's much more controlled and they take that opportunity to make it a communication tool since uh, food mm -hmm. is a motivation. And so it's like, okay, ask for more goldfish and you get two more. <laughs> yeah. And so you only get two goldfish or one goldfish. So you don't utilize or you don't find out if the student is will stuff all their food in their mouth or not because you're controlling they get, it. <laughs> right. You're controlling it for communication. It's the same thing with 
you know, liquids, you sort of say, well, do they use an open cup? Well, no, we only give them two tablespoons in the cup and or a sippy cup, and that's all they've progressed to. Yeah. So are you in EI or are you in uh, the three to five? No, I'm in the school based after okay. they get. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and, you know, as well as I do, when it comes to the public schools, you know, we get what we get. <laughs> and then, and then we begin working and doing what we need to do. Um, and so, you know, you have a very active EI program and they're doing a lot of feeding and swallowing. You're going to come with a lot of information, maybe even more than you hopeful, but in other times you're not going to get the information you need, but communication with the EI therapist often will help. It just depends on what they're doing. And like you said, that may not be helpful, really. I'm going to take a quick glance at the chat. Um, do other EI programs have nurses uh, providing services in the homes? And so Natalie's response here uh, was that they have SLP providing for zero to three, but they only have one SLP. Uh, yeah, and, and I can tell you that, um, honestly, that is a concern, the staff, you know, low staff, uh, definitely. Um, so we're, we're going to move on now because I do want to talk to you a little bit about the comparison of medical-based services and um, school-based. And, you know, uh, because my background is in speech, it may be a little heavy handed on that way, but um, if you come from a hospital setting and you're an occupational therapist, I think it'll apply. Um, so in the school setting, the children that we see are usually the result of neurological, neuromuscular syndromes, neuromuscular disorders, syndromes, developmental disabilities, or behavioral and sensory. Whereas in the hospital setting, it's, it's an illness. There's stroke, dementia, Parkinson's, uh, sometimes cancer or a neonatal disorders where the child is sick. So in the schools, most of our children are medically stable and are considered acute. And that makes a big difference on how you treat the child. So if you're coming from a medical setting where you're, you're more um, used to the chronic disability and the person recuperating from an illness, the schools are a very different place to be. In, one of the major differences as well is that we have to have the parent permission from any medical information, whereas a medical setting has uh, easy access to physicians and nurses and other medical professionals. In the hospital setting, it's a very large percentage of what they do. Dysphagia is a large percentage of the speech pathologist role and uh, to some extent of the occupational therapist role. In the schools, it's low incidence. You're not going to have a lot of cases. And that makes it very hard to get the experience that you need to really become more proficient. So even when you address dysphagia, you often have so few children that it's difficult for you to get the experience you need to be proficient. Whereas a medical best SLP, from the minute they get into the hospital setting, they are doing dysphagia for a large part of their day. Another big difference is that in hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, hot patients and all that, they're seen for a limited amount of time. You know, there's often limits and it often depends on insurance or Medicaid. Um, but in the school systems, we work with children from the age of three all the way through 21 years old. So that child could be receiving our swallowing and feeding services for as long as 18 years. And that's different from any other setting. And so we have the benefit of the long-term uh, view with these children and something that we have to prepare for that this is not a short-term thing. This is something this child is gonna have all the way through their program. Uh, the children may move from one school to another. So you're gonna have to have some way of working with the school team from the new school uh, or wherever that child ends up going. So what that all sums up to is that the focus of school-based services are really different from the focus of medical-based services. Um, for school-based, we want our goal, our focus is safe, efficient, and enjoyable meal times at school. Uh, we also are about adequate nutrition and hydration to access the curriculum 
participate socially at school and to attend to their lessons. The medical-based services um, really are focusing on health and returning to the patient to a level of pre-morbid functioning as much as possible. Once the patient is healthy and has recuperated some of their skills, they are then discharged to outpatient. Um, so knowing that the focus of school-based SLPs and OTs is a little bit different and understanding the difference in the settings, I think really helps us to have a clearer vision of what we need to do as professionals, as a school team, in order to provide what these children need. Okay, so now we have, a, are there any questions anyone want to talk about before I start the case study? Okay, then I'm gonna um, go on. This is an example of a student that had a terminal illness and really an example of working as a team throughout the care of this child. This child had Batten's disease, which is a fatal inherited disorder of the nervous system that begins in childhood. Affected children will suffer mental impairment, worsening seizures and progressive loss of sight and motor skills. Eventually children with juvenile Batten disease become blind, bedridden and unable to communicate. It is always fatal by the late teens or 20s. So Sarah was di diagnosed with Batten in the preschool program through our child search program. She was experiencing the first symptoms we saw were some motor uh, difficulties that was identified by the testing team and the beginning of some difficulties with eating. So the SWALL team evaluated her, wrote a safe plan, trained classroom staff. At that time, the SLP, the OT and the school nurse were the main core members working with Sarah. As Sarah progressed from preschool to elementary school, her plan was constantly changed. Then the PT became involved as her gross motor skills regressed and the OT kind of became more involved to work with the adapted utensils and equipment as she lost her fine motor skills. Uh, speech began working closely with the parents and the classroom staff on diet modifications. However, the parents were extremely resistant in changes to how Sarah ate. By second grade, her feed, feeding had deteriorated to the point where she was completely dependent on the paraprofessional to feed her a puree diet. The OT was no longer working on feeding skills, but the PT continued to work on positioning her for feeding and using a standard during the day. She had minimal control of all motor school skills. The nurse did daily checks of res respiration status. By third grade, the disorder had progressed to the point where she was no longer able to feed safely at school. Parents refused physician recommendations for a peg tube. She got very ill, went to the hospital where at that time they inserted an NG tube. The parents indicated to the school staff that they were inserting the NG tube at home themselves and that does not follow medical protocol. The student would have frequent coughing fits at school where the mucus plugs were often expelled. And when she would have these, it would move the NG tube. Um, so we had a real issue. The nurses, uh, um, school team was led by the nurse at that point, pretty much OT and speech had uh, bowed out mostly for that. PT still, it was required that they had, she had to do the standards so that the PT stayed involved on that. Um, but the nurses had major safety concerns because many times the tube moved beyond the mark of safety during those episodes. Um, so there was just a shift in the team. And that's why I thought this was a, a good kind of longitudinal uh, indication of how your team effort will work and how it will involve different professionals as the child goes on. So during a meeting with the parents, the supervisors and uh, the parents, they indicated that they wanted the nurse to simply adjust the end tube, just push it back in. Well, we know that that's very risky because that tube could then go into the airway rather than into the uh, esophagus. Uh, so it's just something we could not do. Uh, and according to the nurse's medical pro protocol, she could not do that. It had to go through a series of steps to ensure that it was placed correctly and uh, x-ray following insertion. So the district refused to agree to that and the student was sent home until it was resolved. 
The supervisor and legal staff were involved and it was eventually settled with the following. The student continued to be fed by NG tube at school because the student was now too sick for a PEG tube insertion. The school nurse and the coordinator of nurses went for training to learn how to reinsert the tube when it was slightly displaced. The nurse monitored the placement of the tube on a regular basis throughout the school day. When the tube moved to a point beyond the marking, the school contacted the parents to take the student to the hospital to have it reinstated. If they could not get in touch with the parents, they then called an ambulance, which took them to the took her to the hospital to be uh, have the tube placed. This really was considered a win for the district and the school team and the child because the father was not allowed to come and put the tube in place because the school, school would know the tube was inserted correctly when it moved and the parent would have to provide proof from the hospital that the tube was reinstated at the hospital. Um, so I thought this was <clears throat> an example of everybody really working together to the extent that they were needed. Um, so I think we have like four minutes. So let's let's talk if you if you feel like talking or if there's any chats in the chat room that you want me to respond to. If you have any questions about anything uh, we've talked about today, um, now's the time. <laughs>